Let's take our Bibles now and let's turn to uh, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. And we're going to be reading from verses 3 through 12. That's 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. If you, have, uh, if you don't have your Bible with you, there's Bibles in front of you in the little pockets. And uh, that is on page 1014, if you want to follow along. <coughs> Let's follow along as I read. Hear God's word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through, though it's tested by fire, may be found to a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that they have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. And Father, as we read these words from Peter, we just... We just come before you in praise and honor about our salvation that you, through your mercy and through your grace, has bestowed upon us. And Father, we just thank you and in, in awe of what you do for us who are unworthy. Father, as, as we open these scriptures, as Taylor opens these scriptures, Father, I pray that you will give him the words that he needs to say, that you will honor his study time, and that you will speak through him and deliver the message that you have for us today. Father, as, as we prepare our hearts, I pray that the Holy Spirit will open them up and that we will listen in one accord to your teaching. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Meadowview. It's good to be with you as it is each week here. If I don't get a chance to tell you personally, happy Thanksgiving this week. We have... As George said, a lot to be thankful for. Um, I think this passage probably says it better than, than I ever could, so I'm going to let it do the talking this morning. If you have a Bible uh, that you opened uh, before and have now shut, please open it back to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be in there a lot and, and dig through this thing pretty good this morning. So if you haven't been with us the last couple of weeks, George has been taking us through the book of Revelation. Last week uh, he preached... Uh, on the letter to the church of Philadelphia, a, a beleaguered and a weary and yet faithful church. I thought this week a great detour passage as I contemplated what I'm thankful for, as I contemplated even the coming season of Advent. I thought a good detour passage would be 1 Peter chapter 1, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. Another letter that was written to a beleaguered and weary group of Christians. Don't get it wrong, even in 2019, while we're not exiles dispersed throughout Asia Minor, as Peter was writing, we in the church, we believers in Jesus, need to hear encouragement. We need to hear good news. We need to hear and be reminded of what we're thankful for. We need to hear and be reminded of what God has done and what God is doing and what God will do. First Peter serves to do that. This 
great opening to 1 Peter does that for us this morning. There are two things that everybody in the room understands. I don't care where you grew up. I don't care what your worldview is. Well, I do care, but I don't care in this sense. There are two things that we all understand, and that's hope and disappointment. Hope plays such a powerful role in our lives. We hope all the time. Even when we don't realize we're hoping, we are hoping. Sometimes you can't get through that Tuesday work day without thinking about the weekend to come. You can't get through this month of work without thinking about that trip to Paris that's coming up in the next couple weeks or whatever it is. We spend all of our time hoping. The problem with this is that in sin, we often hope in the wrong things. We place our expectations in things that cannot live up to what we are expecting them to do. We put our hope in our job. We put our hope in our bank account. We put our hope in our children. We put our hope in our spouses. We put our hope in our local church. We put our hope in our abilities. We put our hope in everything but God. And we all understand disappointment because when those things don't live up to the lofty expectations we've given to them, we get disappointed. We all are looking for peace and belonging and fulfillment, and acceptance. And no matter how your, great your spouse is, I guarantee you you don't have a spouse as good as mine. Uh, yeah, mine's better than yours. She cannot give me the things that I most ultimately need. She was not created to do that. Neither was my job. Neither was my bank account. There is one thing and one thing only that can give us the hope that we need to persevere, the hope that we need to endure, the hope that we need to be truly thankful. There's one thing and one thing only. One of my favorite moments of my life was when I was seven years old. I slept over at my grandparents' house that weekend, and early in the morning, my Uncle Ray came in and woke me up and asked me if I wanted to go to the Virginia Tech UVA football game in Charlottesville later that day. I can tell you, in my entire life, now 24 years later, I guarantee you I have never jumped out of bed so fast with so much excitement and enthusiasm ever again. And probably won't at this point. I, don't, I can't really hop with enthusiasm anymore. It's not really a thing my knees allow. But I was so excited to go to this football game. This was gonna be the first Virginia Tech game I had ever been to. I had grown up in a Virginia Tech family. And when you grow up in Virginia where there's no pro teams, the Virginia Tech UVA game is as big as it gets. It is the Super Bowl when you're a seven-year-old growing up in Virginia. UVA was not just the other big school in the state. UVA was the bad guy, the enemy, the ones we disliked. There were, yeah, amen. <laughs> Wayne Dick, I was so happy you were here when I got here to Meadowview and I knew there was another Hokie in the building. That makes me so happy. I had friends that were UVA fans that were, we had tension, like, like real tension, especially when the game in November rolled around. And, and here I was, a seven-year-old with an opportunity to go to the game. And I remember the drive up Interstate 64 in Virginia, one of, um, it's a boring drive, but it's a beautiful drive in the fall, Interstate 64. And I remember that day just, I couldn't sit still. Like, I mean, I, like I, was, I needed a seatbelt because I was, I was wiggling, I was so excited. Couldn't sit still. That two hour car drive seemed like it took forever. We finally got there and even to this day, I can remember in my mind the sights and the people and the smells and the noises and everything about it. I remember walking into the stadium and it looked like it was just massive, huge. It was incredible. The atmosphere was amazing and, and Virginia Tech won that day, which makes it better. Anytime, the problem with sporting events is, as great as the day is, if your team loses, it's wrecked. So the fact that Virginia Tech won that day uh, was great. And, and forever I have this awesome memory of the time I got to go to the Virginia Tech UVA football game and the Hokies won. It's great. It was one of the times in my life where the hope actually lived up to the expectations. It lived up to the hype. It was amazing. But it was not ultimately amazing. It didn't help me to endure. I want to, you to imagine for a second how ridiculous and unhelpful it would be if one morning when I was in the doldrums of a frustrating and stressful week, not that that happens with my job here ever, 
But if I woke up and my wife was to put her hand on my, my shoulder and say, babe, it's fine, cheer up. 24 years ago, you went to an awesome football game and Tech won. Your, your week needs to be better. Rejoice. It would be ridiculous and unhelpful. And I know that's an extreme example, but how often do we do this? How often do we try to place eternal expectations on things that are not eternal, on things that are temporal, things that are not meant to satisfy? Matt Chandler said this, man was created for eternal things. And so temporal things can only satisfy you temporarily. Let me repeat that because I think that quote is profound and amazing. Man was created for eternal things. Therefore, temporal things can only satisfy you temporarily. And anything that is not God is temporal. Anything that is not God is temporal. This passage, Peter points us to a hope. Peter points beleaguered and weary Christians paints a picture of hope that is much better than even tech beating UVA. And that needs to be told to me in a big way, especially because tech plays UVA in a few days. He talks, to, he talks about what he calls living hope. A living hope. A hope that is so strong and so eternal and so powerful that even in the midst of the worst trials and suffering that we can encounter, even in the midst of death, our rejoicing can endure. It's the same living hope that carried Peter to martyrdom, knowing that he was safe and secure, and therefore he could rejoice, even in the midst of suffering. Let's take a look at the passage. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I was so excited to get to study it this week. I was like a little kid. I was, so, I was such a nerd Monday morning. I'm just letting you know. Just, it was great. Peter, though, is more excited than I was to write this letter. Peter opens this thing with just the most excitement in his voice that you hear. He opens it the same way Paul opens Ephesians and 2 Corinthians with the exact same phrase in the Greek, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, or or, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. John Piper, which he's known for explosions of excitement, he said, Peter explodes with praise explodes with praise, bursting out of the gate like a track runner to not only give praise to God, but to affirm the deity of Jesus Christ, that which marks him as a Christian. What differentiates him is this affirmation that Jesus Christ is indeed the true and only son of the living God. There's proof of the excitement in the text. I don't have to tell you. I can show you that you notice in your English translation, there's not even a period until the fifth verse. In the Greek, there's not a period until the end of the ninth verse. In other words, Peter can't get this out fast enough. If you ever talk to a little kid about something that they did that was exciting during the day, they talk so fast, they like lose their breath because they can't tell you fast enough. I have a picture of Peter writing this furiously and shaking his hand out to avoid cramps because he can't get it out. This is good news. He can't take a breath. He opens verse three with this, according to his, that is God's great mercy God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. By God's abundant or great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He uses the Greek verb anaganao, which is used only here. It's only twice in the book of Peter, but this is the only time we see it. It is this idea of being caused to be born again. It's not just the verb for born again. It's being caused to be born again. To use an old-fashioned term, to beget us again. This is a, a verb that is unique to Peter, but it is one also that is a, presents a, an idea that is a common thread, not just throughout the New Testament, but through all of Scripture. We read a couple of weeks ago as part of our call to worship, Ezekiel. 36, the valley of the dry bones and how God will breathe new life into them. Jeremiah talks about this as well. John chapter 3, Jesus says you need to be born again. 
Paul talked about the new creation and the new self. This is a common thread throughout the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that the only way, what it means to be made as a Christian, what it means to be as a true believer in Jesus is to be born again. You need to be a new creation. Apart from Christ, our problem is not that we're basically good, but in need of some help. Jesus didn't come to help. Jesus didn't come to fix you. That's not what happened. You're not a car that isn't running right that Jesus needs to put a new transmission into. That is literally all I know about cars. I'm not going to go any further with that. But the fact of the matter is, no, Jesus doesn't come along to fix the car. He blows the car up and gets a new one, builds a new one from scratch. He builds a new one. We are born again as a new creation to a living hope. That's what Peter says. By God's abundant mercy. This is a hope that cannot be extinguished, a hope that is so profound and different the word hope is such a word, is, is such a profound and different word in the New Testament, not a Disney hope that we try to pull out in our own lives, where I hope Virginia Tech beats UVA, or I hope my car doesn't get towed from the parking lot today, or I hope my wife wants to go eat Mexican food for lunch, or whatever. Like, that's not the hope we're talking about. The New Testament writers present hope as something that is complete, something that has already happened, something that they are so sure of that you can talk as if it's done. Because the work of Christ is finished and it's rooted in a God who keeps his promises. A God who lives up to the hype and the expectations. This is a living hope. More on that word living shortly. What are the grounds for this hope? What, how can we as, as, as people of God, those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, how can you and I say without a shadow of a doubt that we have a living hope? This is an important question. You and I need to have an answer to. In fact, Peter later in his book, in probably the most well-known verse of this book, 1 Peter 3.15, says that Christians need to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. In other words, I'll ask you very practically, and I'm talking to each and every one of you individually, if you were to go out to your car or with your family after this church service and there were reporters out in the parking lot that stopped you and asked, what is the reason for your hope? Would you have an answer to that question? Would you have an answer to the question, what is the reason for your hope that didn't involve temporal things and didn't involve anything about you? <laughs> what is the reason for the hope is in you? The point of this passage is that the hope that we have is not rooted in our ability. It's not rooted in the things of this world. So would you have an answer to that question? Fortunately, Peter helps us out. He provides us three concrete, objective reasons for our living hope. Verse three is mind-blowing. Verse three and four as it goes in. It's, it's mind-blowing. That's not what Peter says. First, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, essentially what he's saying is that you and I can have a real, concrete, living hope because it's based in things that have nothing to do with us. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you. And even me, the sinful 2019 borderline millennial who would love to believe that I can change the world with my word, like even me who would like to fight that with all I'm worth, the truth of the matter is, praise be to God, it's not up to me. Praise be to God, it's not up to me. And that's what Peter is saying right here, our being born again, our status before God, the King, is not now, it was not ever, and it will never be based on our works or our goodness. It is based entirely on the abundant mercy and grace of God. Peter wants this to be as clear as possible, and that's why he used that verb that means he has caused you to be born again. It's extra emphasis. Just in case you weren't sure, he has caused you to be born again. The same way you had no role in your physical birth. When you were born, you didn't get to pick the time. You didn't get to pick your parents. You didn't get to pick the hospital. You didn't get to pick the doctor. You didn't get to pick anything about it, but you were born apart from your own ability. Very similar. That's why the word born is, is used. That's why this is the picture that we have. It's very similar. Jesus has done the work, and by God's abundant grace and mercy, this work has been applied to you. 
not by your goodness, but by his abundant grace and mercy. And in that objective truth, in that objective God, we can have hope. But he goes on. Not only has God, by his abundant grace and mercy, given us a living hope by causing us to be born again, Peter says this is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is incredibly profound. I said this to our youth when I preached to them at the retreat on abiding in Christ, but it's no less important for the rest of you in here. Still important for them, by the way. Listen up, youth. How ridiculous would what we're doing here this morning be if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead? Have you thought of this before? What it would mean is that you and I have decided, instead of getting extra sleep, catching up on work, helping to feed the poor, spending more time with our family, playing golf, whatever it is that you would like to do in your free time, have decided to come to this place to sing songs about and pray to a dead, homeless Jewish rabbi from 3,000 years ago. And right now, you are all staring and listening to a 31-year-old man who has a decent beard, but has a lot of insecurities and a deep sin problem of his own. And his words are based on the teaching of this dead, homeless Jewish rabbi from 3,000 years ago. And that's what you've given your Sunday to. It would be ridiculous. Peter, or Paul picks up on this. 1 Corinthians 15, he says that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, we, Christians of all people, are, of, are, are most to be pitied. But the very next verse of 1 Corinthians 15 is one you should have highlighted in your Bible. Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And that changes everything. Three days after Jesus Christ took the sin of his people to the cross and endured the Father's wrath, he walked out of the grave. And after he ascended He is even now seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for his people on their behalf. And one day, the living Christ will return in his full glory, and we will see his kingdom, and we will live with him forever. Amen and amen. And that is true because of the resurrection. It is the hinge point that Christianity turns on. If the resurrection is not true, then everything else falls apart. But the resurrection is true And nobody understood not only the importance of this, but the need for this than Peter. (laughs) Remember Peter's story. Peter betrayed Christ three times at his trial. He wept bitterly. You can imagine for those three days the agony, the hopelessness that Peter was sitting in, knowing what he had done, having seen his Lord and his Savior who he spent these years following with his life was just put to death. And you can imagine this kind of hopeless feeling that he had, knowing that this was his the last chance. And that all changed the second those women ran into the room and said, he is risen. And that's why in those gospel accounts, you hear Peter racing out of the room, racing out of the room to the grave. It's a, a beautiful picture of a man who was hopeless, but now has been filled with a living hope because he knows his savior is alive. He's given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Edmund Clowney said, Jesus, uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter presents our new birth not in the resurrection not merely as a message from the resurrection, but as the fact of the, revel- of the resurrection. Not merely as a message from the resurrection, but as the fact from the revelation, uh, resurrection. When Jesus arose, His people arose with him. Amazing. Peter goes on, though. This theologically dense and and, and incredibly robust couple of verses. He says, not only is your living hope done completely by the work of God and his abundant grace and mercy, not only is your hope secured through the factual reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but... This living hope points you to an inheritance that is being kept in heaven for you. 
One of my favorite things here is that Peter uses the word inheritance, and that is the only word that it can be translated as, is the word inheritance. It's not merely treasure. It's inheritance. This harkens the ancient Jew and us as well back to the days of the Old Testament. This idea of an inheritance, the land that God promised to his people. The promises of God being rooted in, in the inheritance, but it also links to the idea of being a child. What do you think of when you think of inheritance? You think of, of being a child. When we are born again, we are adopted into God's family. We sang earlier those words, I ha- I'm no longer a slave to fear, I'm a child of God. I can stand and sing because I am a child of God. We don't have longer have to act as strangers or as enemies. We no longer have to act as anything but children. The way that children boldly burst into their parents' conversations with no regard whatsoever. And their parents break out of those conversations and fixate on their children, listen to what their children have to say. So God does for us. When we pray, God looks and he listens and he says, let me hear from you. We have an inheritance. He says the inheritance is imperishable. It will never expire. It's undefiled. It cannot be corrupted by human hands or anything else. Also, it's unfading. That's the one that stuck with me this week as I I studied. Have you ever thought about what unfading actually feels like? (laughs) You ever thought about that? I heard a pastor tell this story when his his son was six years old and on Christmas morning, he opened the gift that he wanted. And the only response that he could muster, this six-year-old boy looking at this gift was just weeping. (laughs) He just started to weep, like, like full-on ugly cry. Like that was all he had to express the excitement of this gift. And yet 48 hours later, he's walking around and he says, Dad, I'm bored. Less than 48 hours, he's gone from weeping with excitement to bored. How often do we do that? getting the greatest news we could ever imagine here on, on earth. And, and, and like an hour later, we're stressed about money or something else. That's us. Everything in our lives is fading. Everything. And yet Peter says that this inheritance is unfading. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading It's beyond the hands of any human being or the devil or anyone else. And he he, he doubles down on this next by saying that this inheritance is secure. He says it's being kept or guarded for you in heaven. But the cool thing he does here is not only does he say in verse 5, or excuse me, in verse four, that that the inheritance is being kept or guarded in heaven for you. He says in verse five that you are being guarded or kept by God's power for it. We forget this. Paul Tripp said that we are so good at preaching gospel future and we are so good at preaching gospel past, but so often we miss gospel present. The gospel in this day, 2019, as you sit in Lexington, North Carolina, is that you are being kept and guarded by God's power for an inheritance being kept for you. In other words, nothing can touch you. Nothing can touch your inheritance. Nothing can touch you. The same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in you, Paul says. By God's power, you are being kept and being guarded and nothing can tear you away from that inheritance. Nothing can stop the promises of God. Nothing can stop the work of God. He will fulfill everything to his people as he's promised. Paul says in Philippians 1, He, God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We serve a God that fulfills his promises but also finishes his work. This is not a God who has a half-fixed treehouse sitting in the backyard for eight years when his kids go to middle school and he realizes time's up. No, God finishes his work. God will finish his work. The inheritance that has been promised is being guarded and we are being guarded for it, for a salvation that is ready to be revealed 
at the last time. Incredible. So that's your having a hope that is alive. But it's good that we know that we can have a real living hope because you and I desperately need a living hope. We need this living hope. It's my second point. I promise to be a little more brief. Peter has delivered the glorious good news, but he does not want us to forget that what it is to live in this world is a world of trials and suffering. The Christian life, nobody ever said it was gonna be easy. The Christian life is hard. The world is a scary and evil place. Cancer is a thing. Betrayal is a thing. Divorce is a thing. And there are all sorts of other things. Even now, the next thing in your life could be lurking an hour, two, a day, a week to turn your life upside down. We're not promised tomorrow on this earth. Edmund Clowney uh, says this about these verses in his commentary. Dramatically, Peter goes from ecstasy to agony in verse six. We who rejoice in Christ are grieved by various trials. No doubt Peter thinks not only of the suffering of Christians, but of Christ himself. Peter knew how Jesus had been put to grief. Yet because of his grief, his people can rejoice, even in suffering, even in grief, even in suffering. I can tell you sometimes I love Greek. When I was a student in Greek, I can tell you I hated Greek. But now, having had Greek, I can tell you I love Greek. Because Greek has a way of being profound and helpful in a way English isn't. Peter uses specific language in this passage to help us understand what he really means in verse six. It's incredibly important that you understand that the word rejoice is not meant and not written in the imperative. It is written in the indicative. Some of you look at me like, what in the world does that mean? I'll tell you, the Greek indicative presents an action as something real or certain. Something that is objectively true. An action that is objectively true, not a command. Peter is not saying to you right now, you need to rejoice even though you're facing trials. Despite your trials, rejoice. That's not what Peter is saying. He doesn't speak in the command. What he says is this. In this, the living hope that I've told you about from the first five verses, or first four verses, in this, you rejoice. Indicative, objective, continuous. It's incredibly profound. Peter is not encouraging you to rejoice in the midst. He's saying you continue to rejoice because of the living hope. The living hope which does not change with your circumstances. If an event, if something were to happen this afternoon that would turn your life upside down, the promises and the hope from God are no different than they are right now. And they weren't different yesterday and they won't be different tomorrow. And therefore, in light of that, you can rejoice. This is not an irrational happiness. This is not some kind of cheer up and pretend like it's not really a problem because Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is a concrete living hope that is unchangeable to an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading. Your suffering, your trials happen, as Peter says, for a little while. Now for a little while. But your living hope, your inheritance is eternal. Suffering will come and go. But God's promises are forever. It's not a sin to grieve in the midst of trials. I don't want to minimize suffering in trials. All of you know those all too well. It's not wrong to grieve at death. Even Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus. It is not a sin to grieve in various trials. And I love that Peter puts that in. 
It says that you've been grieved by various trials. But what Peter is saying here is that your suffering and your trials are not an end to themselves. They're not the end of the story because they quake in the presence of the promises of God. They are destroyed by the power of God because you are being kept for an inheritance. It's the same thing that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 6 when he describes Christians as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Not only does he do this, he also explains a reason for our trials. We need to know that our trials aren't in vain. Our trials aren't for coincidence or for no reason. He says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor. He says our faith, the living hope we have is more precious than gold. And if gold needs to go through fire to burn off imperfections, to be brought to its fullest glory, why would that not be true of your faith? Why would that not be true of you? The tested genuineness of your faith may result in praise and glory and honor. And so rejoice, though you have been grieved by various trials. Rejoice. Even though these things are not small, they're not insignificant. However, understand that these trials, these sufferings, are indeed, imper- are indeed perishable. <laughs> they are indeed fading. Unlike your inheritance, which is kept for you even now by God's power. He wraps up by saying, rejoice with a joy inexpressible that your joy may be filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. And that even though your sufferings seem like they are just too much right now, understand that one day you will walk into the throne room of God and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because your, your inheritance has been kept for you and you have been kept for your inheritance. Finally, I want to close with verses 10 to 12. Here, Peter talks about suffering, but he gives way back into God's glory. He writes these three verses that are just amazing. (laughs) Amazing, amazing. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. This is an incredible thought that Peter is speaking to. Because what we understand about the Bible is that this is not a separated group of stories that account to one person in one time and one place, and they only matter then, and they only, they, they're not, it's not that way. This is one long story of God's redemption of his people. From the time we sinned in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, God promised a conqueror would come. And even through really bad judges and and evil kings and exile and and persecution and and, and trial and suffering, that conqueror was still to come. What Peter is doing here is trying to link the promises that he is writing about here to the promises all the way back in the garden. Paul Tripp said in his sermon on this passage that if basically what Peter is doing in this passage, if you're in Christ, he is writing your spiritual biography. Because you and I, in our faith in Christ, are part of this story. We are given part in this story. Peter says here that the prophets of old prophesied about the grace that was to be ours. These ordinary men that were chosen by God to write of the future promises for God's people. To cause them to look forward and hope were written with us in mind. 
They didn't know fully how God's promises were gonna unfold as he says. They didn't know who or when or what time the, the, the spirit of Christ was coming. And yet they were still writing to point forward. And he says, not for their sake, but for ours, so that we might know that this is not just isolated to us. This is a story that goes far back, long before us. You can imagine Isaiah sitting there pinning Isaiah 53. As he talks about the suffering servant. This incredible passage about this suffering servant that was gonna come and bring about the redemption of God's people and Isaiah not having a clue what that was gonna look like, who this was gonna be, when that conqueror was gonna come. But Isaiah writes and he longs. And when you read the writings of the prophets, you can see longing in their words. Looking, hoping, waiting to see the time when God was gonna unleash the plan when God was gonna bring about the redemption of his people. The Old Testament is not just a dusty book of old saints. It's not just lists of genealogies and confusing places and, and, and really weird stories. Like that's not what the Old Testament is. What the Old Testament is, is a story that begins in the garden and unfolds from there that a conqueror was gonna to come to redeem the people of God and all of those prophets, all of those judges, all of those kings, every movement, every character, every story is pointing and flowing in the same direction. They're all moving to that night in Bethlehem when the conqueror arrived. Amen to that, the conqueror was on the scene and he was crushed for our iniquity. And he was bruised for our transgressions and by his wounds, we are healed. The redemption of God's people was what the prophets longed to see. And they wrote, and through the Holy Spirit, when you hear the good news that is preached, you get to take part in this story. God has given you and me a front row seat to this. You realize what he's saying is that you have a better seat than Isaiah. <laughs> You're sitting in the front row. You get to see the hope, the glory, the gospel that is unfolding. He goes on to say this incredible tag at the, ver the end of verse 11, which deserves a sermon all in itself, that he says, things into which angels long to look Angels who are not created as, as, as they, they're created as perfect, perfect beings. They get to see the face of God every day. They get to not be in the need of redemption, but the angels cannot take their eyes off of what God is doing. The angels can't help but tune in to every episode. They're binge watching this thing, man. The angels who have seen all the glory, all the wonder, all of the miracles, all of the things throughout all of the history of time, cannot help but look at what God is doing in your life. That is what Peter says. The unfolding promises of God. How amazing a thought that is. And so I hope, a couple quick practical things before I wrap it up. I hope you read the prophets. I hope you read the prophets. Read Obadiah today. It's like 15 verses. Read Obadiah today. Read the prophets is the point. We ignore that part of the Bible way too much. They were longing for the time when God would bring about the conqueror in the same way in 2019 that we long for Jesus to return. It's, they are longing for the first coming of Christ. Read the prophets. The promises of God are incredible. The other thing is pray for your pastors. I don't say this selfishly. I don't say this because, you know, I'm really about me. I say this because what Peter says here is that this good news is being brought to you through the Holy Spirit by those who preach the good news. That's how Paul said the good news comes to you by the preaching of the word. Pray for George. Pray for your pastors who study and they, they contemplate each week. It's a weighty thing. It's a weighty thing, but... God brings the good news to his people through the preached word. And understand that your salvation is not just a footnote. Your salvation is a major part of the story. You have a front row seat. The angels long to look at what God has done. 
They long to look at this. If you're a believer in this room this morning, the message for you is simple. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. By God's mercy, you have been caused to be born again to a living hope. God has secured for you a glorious inheritance and he is securing you for it. Endure, persevere. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. If you're not in Christ this morning, if you know you're in this room and you have come because relatives wouldn't leave you alone or you are here because uh, you, 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 you know, you, you just, you're living a lie. You'd like for people to think you're a Christian, but you know you're not. If you're not, if you're not a believer, first of all, I'm so glad that you're here. <laughs> so glad that you're here. If you're not a believer, my prayer is that you would contemplate these things. Contemplate these things. Understand that there is one source, there is one hope that is truly capable of fulfilling your every expectation and every dream and every desire, that longing for peace and fulfillment and for acceptance that you definitely have, whether you admit it or not, can only be found one place, is at the cross of Jesus Christ. You too can understand this living hope. You too can understand enduring. You too can understand perseverance. After the service, myself or George or the elders or plenty of people in the room would love to talk to you, would love to pray with you about this. Don't wait. (laughs) Don't wait another day. Don't wait another hour. There's nothing that can satisfy your longing. As we go into Thanksgiving week, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have been cause to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to an inheritance that is an imperishable and undefiled and unfading. The conqueror has come and his work is done. Let's pray.